Just beneath the surface of the world's open oceans, one of the most underrated predators roams. Sleek in its posture, camouflaged against the backdrop of its pelagic habitat, and armed with razor-sharp precision. This is the blue shark, the ocean's cobalt torpedo. With a body built for efficiency and a deadly hunting style, this is no ordinary shark. This is a creature carved and evolved by the chaos of the open sea. So come with me today as we dive deep into the life of this stealthy predator. From its mysterious migrations, crazy adaptations, and a vital role in the food chain, you're about to witness a side of the blue shark that you've never seen before. Welcome back to another Shark Bites creature feature, everyone. Now, I know I pretty much say this every single time, but the blue shark is easily one of my most favorite shark species out there. We get them where I live here in Cornwall every summer, and I've had the pleasure of spending loads of time in the water with them down the years. Right, okay then, enough natter, let's jump into this creature feature. Now, the blue shark, Prinase Glauca, is undoubtedly one of the ocean's most impressive nomads. This shark species is thought to be the most widely distributed shark in the world, inhabiting almost all the temperate and tropical waters of planet Earth. They do tend to avoid the polar regions, but that doesn't stop them getting pretty damn close. Towards the Arctic, they're found as far north as Norway, and then heading south, they've regularly been seen in Chilean waters, and the waters of both of those countries are cold. But this incredible habitat flexibility is owed to their ability to tolerate a really wide range of temperatures. Normally, they'll be found in waters that range from around 12 to 20 degrees Celsius, but they have been found in waters as warm as 25 degrees Celsius and as cold as 7 degrees Celsius. In those tropical regions where it's starting to push a bit closer towards 25 degrees Celsius, they'll tend to stick to those deeper depths purely because it's a bit cooler down there and more within their temperature tolerable range. One of the main reasons as to why they're found in so many different places around the world though is due to their highly migratory nature. These sharks undertake monstrous transoceanic migrations every year in the Atlantic, the Pacific and the Indian Ocean. Although I'd say our best scientific understanding of these movements stems from the Atlantic Ocean population. It's thought that adult blue sharks will breed initially in the western Atlantic off the coast of North America and even as far down as the Caribbean. After mating they'll head all the way across to the eastern Atlantic around the southwest of Europe and North Africa. Here they'll give birth to live young with litter sizes ranging from as little as four or five all the way up to over a hundred teeny tiny 40 centimeter long blue sharks. And so once they've dropped their cargo load, they'll complete their migration by moving back across the Atlantic again towards North America. And this entire journey is around 6,000 miles, just shy of 10,000 kilometers. What a trek. Based on the most recent science, the younger immature blue sharks don't really tend to follow this pattern and are a bit more erratic with their movements. It's quite a feat of nature though for the adults to be able to travel those kind of distances annually. The amount of energy that takes to do something like that is astonishing. But the blue shark has a few tricks up its sleeve to help it out. And the first one is using the existing ocean currents to give it a bit of a push. The Gulf Stream plays a big role in aiding them on this clockwise Atlantic migration with the warm and swift current pushing them from those Caribbean and North American waters all the way across to the UK. And by using the Gulf Stream, it conserves that precious energy that otherwise would have been spent swimming all that way. But that's not the only strategy they use to help them save energy. They're also very clever swimmers. Like other pelagic species, the layout of the blue shark's body plays a massive role in helping them swim during those migrations. I'd say they're probably one of the most slender and pointed shark species out there, almost appearing eel-like. But it's that torpedo shape that makes them incredibly efficient swimmers. As well as this, their paddle-like pectoral fins act very much in the same way that aeroplane wings do, providing lift, reducing drag, and allowing them to glide efficiently through the water. And although they're capable of those quick, short bursts of speed, they're actually relatively slow swimmers for most of the time. Because in reality, it's all about saving energy when you've got to travel the distances that these guys do every single year. Now, it's all good and well saving energy while you're swimming them, but that's not going to be enough to sustain them for the entire duration of that migration. They've got to find some food at some point to fuel those bodies. And so while they're on these huge horizontal migrations, they're also migrating vertically up and down the water column in a process known as dial vertical migration, or DVM. This means that during the day, blue sharks will often drift down to deeper waters, usually around around four or 500 meters deep, and then at night, they'll come back up to the surface again. This dial vertical migration is thought to be heavily influenced by their prey distribution, but temperature does also play a role as well. Down at those depths, blue sharks are likely feeding on one of their favorite prey species, squid. And in some parts of the world, squid make up 80% of a blue shark's diet, mainly due to their high nutritional value. Although these sharks are technically classed as an opportunistic shark species, so they'll eat what they can when they have to. Smaller fish species, crustaceans, or even floating whale carcasses are on the menu for these guys. Anything that's gonna provide an energy source for 
them, really. So they're migrating down to these deeper depths to feed on squid and other bits and bobs. But while they're doing that, once again, they're saving energy. It's thought that down at those depths, they're gaining a bit of a thermoregulatory advantage because it's cooler down there. At higher temperatures, sharks will tend to have a higher metabolic rate, which means they're burning through more energy. Although if it's a little bit cooler, but not too cold, their metabolic rate is lower, so they conserve that energy. Some studies have even reported that blue sharks remaining at the surface burn through two and a half times more energy than the ones that are hanging out down at 400 meters. So even though it might be a little bit harder for them down there to find their prey species because it's pitch black, it pays for them to stay down there during the daytime and then come up to the surface again during the night because it's colder. Ah, all this up and down vertical migration stuff, it's confusing me. Let's move on to something even cooler. Now I'd say it's pretty obvious as to how and why the blue shark got its common name. Yeah, it's because they're really blue. <laughs> I personally think they're one of the most strikingly colored sharks you'll ever see. They really do look magical when you're in the water with them. And recent research has shown us just why it is they are so blue. And when I say recent, this stuff was literally published like last month. So we're talking brand new research here. It turns out blue sharks have special crystals within their dermal denticles that give them that distinctive shade of blue. And those crystals might even give the blue shark the chameleon-like ability of changing color. I know. The dermal denticles within blue shark skin have these pulp-like cavities filled with guanine crystals and tiny sacs that store melanin, which can absorb wavelengths of light. Imagine all these individual cells essentially packed with a bunch of tiny mirrors and bags that can absorb light. So all these little mirrors are basically reflecting the blue light of the ocean around them, giving them that crazy cobalt blue coloration. But when you combine all of these materials together, you create the ability to produce and even change color, potentially giving the blue shark the chameleon color changing ability depending on their environment. When these guanine crystals within their dermal denticles move closer together, the shark appears in its classic blue color. But when they move further apart, the blue shark skin is tinted with greens and golds, which you can kind of see in some of these clips here. So it's all well and good being bright blue or being able to change the color of your skin. But when we're talking science, this has got to have some kind of adaptive trait. Remember we were just talking about how these sharks move up and down the water column, feeding on different prey species depending on where they are. Well, as these sharks move into different areas of the water, they're likely able to camouflage or countershade themselves depending on the environment that they're in. For example, when they're at those deep depths, the pressure of the water down there might push those nanocrystals more tightly together, and so the shark then turns a darker shade of blue, basically blending itself in with that darker blue water around it and completely camouflaging itself from potential prey items. How awesome is that? Of course, I do have to slightly caveat this here with the fact that this actually wasn't done in the wild, it was done in the lab, but it's definitely in their plans for the future. Now, when you live in the pelagic open ocean, it's beneficial to be quite inquisitive of new things in your environment. A blue shark doesn't exactly know when or where its next meal is coming from, so being inquisitive tends to pay off. And boy, are these sharks inquisitive. If you've ever been in the water with these guys or seen videos of people that have been in the water with them, they're probably one of the most in-your-face sharks there is. They will regularly swim right up to your mask or your underwater camera to see what you are and check you out. Normally, they're pretty chilled out, but I did have an experience with these sharks last summer that started to push the boundaries a bit. There's a video coming out on that soon, by the way, so stay tuned for that. But I'd say it's likely because of this bold, inquisitive behavior paired with their slightly opportunistic nature that has led to a few bites on humans down the years. According to the International Shark Attack file, they sit within the top five for fatal, unprovoked attacks on humans. And to be honest, historically, I'd probably say there's been a fair few more than that as well. These pelagic sharks, along with oceanic white tips, would have likely been some of the first to show up after shipwrecks or ocean plane crashes, and based on that opportunistic feeding strategy, they might have taken their chances. I actually think this shark can often be a little bit underestimated when it comes to their interactions with people. You'll again get lots of people online comparing these sharks to puppies being all cuddled and friendly, but spending lots of time in the water with them, I'd say they're more like wolves. Considering their max size can be around 12 feet long, that's a definite predator there capable of causing some harm if circumstances and conditions were right. Sure, that 12 feet's a maximum, but they're averaging around 6 to 9 feet, so that's still a powerful shark. I think I'm making them sound a bit scary here. They're not scary. They're probably one of the best sharks you can spend time in the water with, but you do have to have your wits about you for sure. Now, while they are capable of very rarely injuring humans, the damage that we do to this shark species is so much worse. Because the blue shark is so widely distributed and travels those huge distances both on its horizontal migrations and its vertical ones up and down the water column, it's at massive risk from fisheries. So much so that it's widely recognized as being the single most fish shark species in the world, with catch rates estimated
estimated to be around 20 million individuals every year. 20 million. They're frequently caught both as bycatch in tuna and swordfish fisheries and targeted fisheries as well, who are specifically looking for them to harvest their meat and fins. The blue shark actually makes up around 60% of all reported shark catches globally, which is just a crazy number. Spain, Portugal, Japan, and Taiwan as nations are all notorious fishers of blue sharks, and people always seem to be surprised when I mention Spain and Portugal. But I've often seen the Spanish longline fleet right here in Cornwall going back and forth during the summer months just off the coast, and you can bet they're almost certainly catching blue sharks. And it's this intense fishing pressure that has bumped the blue shark into the near threatened category on the ICM red list. And with those fishing pressures showing no signs of slowing down globally, I'd say we could likely see the blue shark becoming increasingly more threatened in the coming years. Now, we were just talking about a few minutes ago how this shark species has been responsible for a few bites on humans down the years. And one of those bites was actually here in the UK a couple of years ago. It was national news at the time, but it was a bit hush hush and we were never really given an explanation as to what really happened. But don't worry guys, I managed to get the inside scoop for you in this video here. In it, we find out the exact reason why a female snorkeler was bitten. And I promise you guys, you won't find out this information anywhere else on the internet. So make sure you give it a watch. 